Really, that's what you're gonna wear? It doesn't look very professorial. I teach photography at a college all year round, Jordan. This is exactly what I wear. No, you look like a continuing education student who's just there to pick up girls. Jeez, well, I don't want that, do I? Welcome back, Deep Review TV viewers. Chris Nichols here, and today we are gonna learn Photolingo 101. So here's the thing, uh, we get a lot of comments from a lot of our viewers on YouTube wondering about a lot of the terms that we're using in photography or when we're talking about cameras. And I think it's very helpful to be able to play along and understand what all these terms mean. Now we have a lot of viewers on deepreview.com. You are all for the most part very technically minded, sometimes a little too technically minded, and you're gonna hate this video. But we recognize there's so many of our viewers that join us just on YouTube or people that are starting out and this video is for you. So come along with us, we're gonna take a lovely field trip and get out of a stuffy classroom and learn all about photographic beginners terms. All right, so let's start with a very simple concept just to get going. We're going to talk about eye relief. So here's the thing, when we look through a viewfinder with our eye, whether it's an optical one or an electronic one, ideally we want to get a nice magnified view, but be able to see the entire composition. Now the issue is you can't always have your eye right up to the camera's eyepiece for many different reasons which we're going to talk about. And if you have to pull your eye away further from the eyepiece, can you still see that entire composition or are you going to now actually start to darken out those corners? This is eye relief and cameras that have very generous eye relief let you pull your eye further away from the camera eyepiece and still be able to see that entire composition. Some cameras do this optically, some can even digitally crop to give you more enhanced eye relief. Now what are those reasons why we might want to keep our eye away from the viewfinder eyepiece? Pink eye, conjunctivitis, deadly amoebic paramecium type creatures that just want to fester and grow inside your eyeball socket. If you pick up a camera in the woods and you have no idea where it came from, you don't want to put your eye up to that. Rental cameras, disgusting completely. So this is why we want that space between our eyeball and those disgusting germs. Also, apparently some people wear eyeglasses. It's really helpful if you wear eyeglasses, but how many people actually wear eyeglasses? Amoebas. So while we're on the topic of viewfinders, let's explain the terms EVF versus OVF. So EVF stands for electronic viewfinder. This is where you put your eye up to a viewfinder, but what you're seeing is actually a video representation of what the camera is seeing. You can basically think of it like a TV screen. Now an OVF stands for an optical viewfinder. This is where you bring your eye up to a viewfinder and you're actually seeing real light coming either straight through the viewfinder or bounced off a mirror and into a prism. Now I know it says versus on there and that might make you think that there's some sort of competition going on and there might have been in the past but really EVFs have come such a long way and they really do dominate the market now. There's lots of good reasons for that. The biggest though first off an electronic viewfinder shows you your exposure and your color balance before you even take the picture. So as you adjust your settings or change your white balance, real time you see these changes affecting your image in front of you. Another big benefit is electronic viewfinders can give us a lot of manual focusing tools. They can zoom in on a frame for fine adjustments or give us things like peaking so that we can see exactly where our manual focus is. They also give us things like histograms which are a great way to see our exposure and our dynamic range live before we take the picture. Now if you want to shoot video, you also have to do that through an electronic viewfinder or the back screen on your camera. So if you have an optical viewfinder camera like a single lens reflex camera, you can still shoot video, you just have to use the back LCD screen. So are optical viewfinders dead? Well not really. So what is the true benefit of an optical viewfinder? The human eye is truly amazing. We see tons of shadow detail and dynamic range, which we'll talk about shortly. This is something that's not faithfully reproduced in an electronic viewfinder. Now, optical viewfinders on SLR type cameras do give us some tools. We see perspective changes as we change or zoom our lenses. And of course, you can see where you are in focus in your frame. But you gotta remember that modern electronic viewfinders do that and so much more. And although lag used to be an issue and resolution used to be an issue, modern EVFs are very clear and virtually lag free. And yet, optical viewfinders still give you just that, that reality and that actual light coming through the viewfinders. And because of that, I think they're still gonna be enjoyable to use for many years to come. 
Okay, next we're going to learn about SEPA ratings. Now, if you just Google SEPA, you're going to get congenital insensitivity to pain with anhydrosis, which is not going to help you at all when it comes to photography. Luckily, you have me. What this actually stands for is Camera Imaging Products Association. Not nearly as exciting, but when we refer to this in our videos, we're usually referring to battery life. So how does this all play out in our videos? Well, we'll talk about a new camera and we'll usually give you a SEPA rating for battery life. 400 SEPA shots rated. We're going from 300 plus SEPA rated shots. SEPA rating with two batteries full is about 800 shots. But you do have to take those SEPA ratings with a grain of salt and here's why. The ratings are meant to be as fair as possible for many different cameras, but they follow very rigorous procedures. Just to give you a few examples, if the camera has a built-in flash, they will fire that flash half the time. Uh, if it's got a motorized zoom, they'll fully zoom that lens in and out before taking a picture and they'll usually only take a picture every 30 seconds okay this is a lot more power draining than you would normally use a camera in rear world situations and if a camera doesn't have a pop-up flash it's going to get a higher SEPA rating because well there's no flash to fire half the time so you do have to look at these carefully keep in mind too that there's certain companies out there just to name a couple Fuji and Panasonic for example where they'll by default set the camera settings like viewfinder refresh rates or performance modes to lower power usage by default. Now the SEPA rating takes this into account, you get a much higher rating, but when you then use that camera in the real world, you're up in that viewfinder refresh rate, you're turning on that Fuji performance boost mode, and now you're actually gonna get less shots per battery than what the SEPA rating might suggest. Regardless, it's a great way to get a general idea of what your camera is gonna do, but always take it, as we said, with a grain of salt. All right, I want to talk to you guys about shutter life. And no, this is not a hashtag for Instagrammers to use in their stoked photography. Actually, they probably do use hashtag shutter life. But when we're talking about it here today, we're talking about it in terms of basically rating for how many mechanical actuations your camera shutter can fire before the manufacturer expects that it will have issues or need replacement. It's not a guarantee. Think of it a lot like mileage in a car. It'll vary what you get, but if you buy a more expensive professional camera, you should get a lot more shots off that shutter before it needs servicing. Now, keep in mind that if you shoot an electronic shutter mode or video, it actually doesn't affect your shutter life in any way, shape or form. So if you have a Sony A9, and you're shooting 20 frames per second. Don't worry about it, not hurting a thing other than the hours and hours you're gonna spend going through the thousands and thousands of photos to cull. Another term that you hear us refer to a lot in our videos, especially nowadays, is BSI. And this refers to a kind of sensor. This stands for Backside Illuminated Sensor. I'm gonna explain this to you, but in the most simple terms possible. Okay, so let's take a look at this drawing here just to further explain what's going on. So here's our older conventional sensor. Now up top, you've got your micro lenses and your color filter shit. Then in the middle, you've got your wiring shit. And then at the bottom here, you've got your photodiode shit which records light and makes an image. Now the problem with the older sensor is that some of this light that comes through hits the wiring and bounces off. And so that light doesn't get through to the photodiode to make up your image. Now when we look at a BSI type sensor, you can notice the wiring's now been moved to the bottom layer. So now when light goes through our micro lenses, it goes right to our photodiode. Look at that. There's nothing in the way to block that extra light. These are also better at capturing light at acute angles coming through here. So anything off from the sides of the is also gonna be recorded in a much more efficient way. All in all, what this BSI means is that you're gonna get better low light performance, better dynamic range, and less shitty pictures. Okay, so what does it mean when we say IBIS versus OIS? Well, first off, the IBIS is a long-legged wading bird. It was revered by the ancient Egyptians. What? As so first off, IBIS stands for in-body image stabilization, and OIS stands for optical or lens-based image stabilization. Now, these two techniques basically achieve the same thing, but in different ways. Now, first off, image stabilization systems are all designed to prevent motion blur created by shaky hands and minor vibrations. And very effectively, what they do is detect the motion of the camera and the lens and then counteract that with the stabilization system. Now, lens-based stabilizers do it right inside the lens, moving the inner elements to counteract that vibration and shake. Now, the only downside is they've got limited controls of axes that they can actually stabilize against. They can prevent up and down vibration and side to side vibration, but they can't do anything about roll because, well, lenses are round and if you roll them, nothing changes. That's actually a big detriment for video. They are, however, very effective, especially when using longer focal length lenses like wildlife and sports lenses. Now, 
Sensor-based or in-body image stabilization systems have a lot of advantages. First off, because they're based inside the camera, they'll work with any lens that you put on that camera. Even adapted glass can get some benefits from image stabilization. On top of that, they can control all five axes, so they give you the widest degree of stabilization, which is also very beneficial for video applications as well as handheld applications. There are some manufacturers, for example Panasonic and Olympus, who are actually incorporating both lens-based stabilizations and sensor-based stabilizations to work in conjunction with each other to give you even better stability. Either way, image stabilization is a great feature, whether it's in your lens or your body. So I know you've seen this word on many videos and forums and all that kind of stuff. It is time to talk about bokeh. That's how I pronounce it anyways. And there's many different ways that people pronounce it. So many misconceptions. Some people say bokeh or uh, bokeh or bokeh or bokeh. I mean, all these different cases. And the commonly held belief is that it's a Japanese term, bokeh, to refer to what the areas of a photo look like in their out of focus areas, the character of that and how pleasing it is. But the real truth is, Canadians actually invented this word. It's just B-O-K, -okay. it's pronounced boke. We use it just like a lot of people use the word stoked. But of course, in Canadian fashion, we add an A on the end. So for example, in a sentence, that lens delivers amazing boke, eh? First thing I want to get out of the way, bokeh has nothing to do with how shallow the depth of field is, okay? It's really more about what is the character, the look, and the rendition of that out of focus representation in your photographs. And the first thing we're going to touch on is the actual shape of your aperture. So the shape of your diaphragm blades will determine the shape of your aperture, and your image is basically made up of multitudes of that particular shape. And when they go out of focus, especially when you see uh, points of light, you'll actually very clearly see the shape of that aperture being created. Now, a lot of modern lenses have more circular diaphragms, which create circular aperture shapes. And then lo and behold, when you look at your out of focus points of light, you will notice that they're very circular in shape. Sometimes you'll even see that the shapes near the corner of your image take on this sort of football or cat's eye shape. And that's just caused by actual blocking of light from the barrels or front element of the lens. You can sometimes get lenses designed to help counteract that, but again, some people find that very pleasing. And here's an example of an image where a Petzval lens takes that effect to the extreme and you almost get this swirling effect around the edges. Sometimes you'll even see a phenomenon that are commonly called onion rings, where you see these concentric rings inside the bokeh. Those are quite distracting as well, and that's usually caused by how manufacturers create certain lens elements, like these spherical elements, inside a lens. Long story short, there's many different ways this can render your image, and they all can be either pleasing or distracting to your taste. But always make sure that the back element of your lens is clean, otherwise even the most beautiful bokeh on a lens will be ruined by big, ugly black spots. I know one technology that needs to go away, and that is chalk. Okay, so let's address the term diffraction. Now, it's very common misconception amongst beginner photographers that using really dark, tight apertures, like on a full-frame camera, things like f16, f22, f32, that you're gonna get the sharpest focus. And that's actually quite the opposite. What you're gonna get is the most depth of field, the most zones of the photo in focus, but you actually get a lot of softness. At really tight, small apertures, the light starts to bend and kind of get fuzzy around the edges of the diaphragm, and you get this overall softening of your image. So really, the rule of thumb is do not use those tight apertures. Avoid them like the plague unless you absolutely need that extra depth of field as a critical importance. Oh yeah, or sun stars. So what is a sun star? Well, if you take a picture of the sun using one of those really tight apertures, the diffraction actually creates this beautiful star effect. And I know it's redundant because all suns in the universe are stars, but you can actually make these star shapes with things other than the sun. You can use car headlights, you can use street lights at night, really any sort of bright, intense, specular highlight shot at a tight aperture has the potential to create a really beautiful star effect. Many different lenses will have different sun star characteristics. That's why we like to take a few test samples every time we review a lens to show that. But typically, wide angles make the most dramatic sun stars. So give it a try next time you're out. Just a few tips. Make sure that you have that star or that bright light with something dark around it. Nighttime is easy, but if it's the sun, try to use the edge of a branch or tree or something because you won't see that star effect very clearly on a bright background. As well, also remember, your image is still going to get a little bit softer if you do that because of diffraction.
All right, I am done with the chalk. I'm done with the jacket. And we are gonna talk about our final topic, which is dynamic range, because it is some serious <laughs> Now, in order to understand dynamic range, I think it's helpful to understand how the human eye works, because to give context, the human eye has incredibly good dynamic range. I can look at very bright areas and very dark areas in the same scene, and I can easily see detail in both. Now, our cameras have always struggled to be able to do that same thing. If I take a picture with a camera and I get bright detailed areas, my shadows often look very dark or completely black. If I expose that the shadows have a lot of detail, then very often the brighter parts of the photograph are blown out and too bright. They just don't have the same ability to capture what we can see. And yet modern cameras are getting better and better with dynamic range. They're getting closer and closer to that ability to capture both light and dark areas in the same scene at the same time. It's also important to think about a camera's maximum dynamic range potential as being its ability to go from right before the brightest highlights clip to whatever the darkest usable shadow is, okay? And really the only way to maximize that potential and harness that dynamic range is to shoot your files in RAW, making use of as much of that dynamic range as possible, and then pushing and pulling things to get your final artistic intent, okay? And if that sounds complicated or you just don't give a f about dynamic range, well then you should probably shoot JPEG. Now honestly, that's about as far as I want to go down the dynamic range rabbit hole today because first off, this is a beginner video. Second off, it's probably 64 minutes long by this point. And third off, there's so many other things that dynamic range connects to. Things like concepts of ETTR, exposing to the right, or things like uh, HLG video, things like ISO invariance and low light performance in general. And we could really teach a lot more and we'd love to do that. So first thing I'm gonna ask is, let us know what you thought about this video. Please leave comments below and suggest you know, there's still a lot more terms that we can talk about. We'd be happy to address those in other videos. Or perhaps you'd like to see something more advanced as we get into these more advanced concepts. We could absolutely do instructional videos about that as well. We hope you enjoyed this one. So please let us know if you want to see that and we'll make it happen. Don't forget, go to our Twitter channels, our Instagram channels. Let us know what you think there. And please do subscribe to this channel. Thank you so much for uh, joining us on our little field trip today. Until next time, see you guys soon.